It is good to see you all this morning. Appreciate your singing and the prayers that have been offered. I certainly ask that you continue to pray at this time that the Lord would bless us mightily in His sweet gospel, that His name will be glorified, and that all we see and do, and that we would be strengthened and edified by the gospel of Jesus Christ. If you would turn with me to Isaiah chapter 1. Isaiah chapter 1. <clears throat> Isaiah chapter 1 is a dire warning to a sinful nation. Isaiah chapter 1, a dire warning to a sinful nation. I'd like to read, to begin with, the first uh, four verses of Isaiah chapter 1. <clears throat> He begins with the vision of Isaiah, the son of Amos, or Amos, which he saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem in the days of Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, kings of Judah. Hear, O heavens, and give ear, O earth, for the Lord hath spoken. I have nourished and brought up children, and they have rebelled against me. The ox knoweth his owner, and the ass his master's crib. But Israel doth not know, my people doth not consider. Ah, sinful nation, a people laden with iniquity, a seed of evildoers, children that are corruptors, they have forsaken the Lord, they have provoked the Holy One of Israel unto anger, they are gone away backward. Now, you would think, what a way to begin the prophecy of Isaiah. Isaiah is referred to, interestingly, as the Bible within the Bible. Isaiah has 66 chapters. The Bible has 66 books in it. Isaiah covers Old Testament history. And the prophecy of the New Testament. The Bible covers the Old Testament history and the New Testament. We rejoice in much of Isaiah's writings. For example, turn with me just for a moment to Isaiah chapter 53. Um, I enjoy and I'm very comforting. I'm both saddened and I rejoice to read Isaiah 53, 52 and 53, where Isaiah speaks in prophecy of the coming of the Messiah. Um, in uh, uh, Isaiah 52 and, and verse number three, uh, 13, pardon me, he says, Behold, my servant shall deal prudently, speaking of the coming of Messiah, he shall be exalted and extolled and very high, speaking of the coming of the Messiah, Jesus Christ, the Son of God. He says, As many uh, were astonished at thee, his visage was so marred more than any, than any man, and his form more than the sons of men. Speaking of the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, so shall he sprinkle many nations. That means he shed his blood for people from many nations. Skip on down for the sake of time to uh, chapter 53. He says, Who hath believed our report? Who hath believed it? And to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? For he shall grow up as a tender plant. Speaking of Jesus Christ, he was born of a virgin woman, and he grew up in, in Jerusalem in the little town of... Uh, of uh, 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 Nazareth, he grew up there as a little child, and he grew to a grown man, and became uh, about eight or thirty years old. He began to present himself as the Son of God with a power. And verse number three says, He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows. You know what made Jesus Christ sorrowful? He came unto his own, and his own received him not. Then on the night before he was crucified, he began to be very sorrowful. You know why? Because the next day, he who knew no sin was made to be sin for us. Well, 
The result of that was, in verse number 4, Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we did esteem him stricken uh, and smitten of God and afflicted. But he was wounded, but what for? For our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. That is, healed from the sin sick disease. We enjoy reading that, do we not? What about uh, what about Isaiah chapter fifty four? Where he speaks of the coming of the church. He says, Sing, O barren, thou that didst not bear, break forth into singing and cry aloud, thou that didst not travail with child. He says, For more are the children of the of the desolate than the children of the married wife, saith the Lord, enlarge the place of the tent. He talks about the great prosperity of the church of Jesus Christ. We like to read of that, do we not? What about Isaiah 62? Just for an example. Isaiah chapter 2, he says, For Zion's sake will I not hold my peace, and for Jerusalem's sake I will not rest, until the righteousness thereof go forth as brightness, and salvation thereof as a lamp that burneth. And the Gentiles shall see thy righteousness, and all the kings thy glory. And thou shalt be called by a new name, which the mouth of the Lord shall name. Thou shalt be a crown of glory in the hand of the Lord, and a royal diadem in the hand of thy God. So he, he's talking about the coming of the church and all of her beauty and her majesty. And she is married to the Son of God, the King of kings, and the Lord of lords. We like to read those things, do we not? Well, I wonder why so much, why so little attention, attention is played, paid to chapter 1. Let's go back with me. To Psalms, Psalm number 9, verse number 17. Here, the psalmist, speaking very much in harmony with Isaiah chapter 1, he says, The wicked shall be turned into hell, that is destruction, and all the nations that what? Forget God. The wicked and the nations that get forget God will be turned into destruction. For the needy shall not always be forgotten. That means God is not going to forget his people. But the wicked and the nations that forget God will be turned into destruction. Now go with me, and I'm going to try to go slow and so that you can go with me. Um, I want you to turn to Hosea. If you come to go back to uh, uh, Isaiah, then, uh, then go to uh, Jeremiah, and then pass Ezekiel and Daniel, and then you'll come to Hosea. Hosea, chapter 13. Hosea, chapter 13. Verse number 9. Hosea writes to Israel, and he says, Hosea 13, and verse number 9. He says, O Israel. Hosea 13 and 9. O Israel. Thou hast done what? Destroyed thyself. O Israel. Thou hast destroyed thyself, but he didn't stop there. He says, but in me is thine what? Help. O Israel, thou hast destroyed thyself, but in me is thine help. Notice verse number 10. He says, I will be thy king. Do we have a king this morning? Yes, we do. And some of the, uh, of our ancestors who fell into persecution, their cry is, was, we have no king but King Jesus. So he says, I will be thy king. Where is any other that may save thee in all of thy cities? And the judges of whom thou said, give me a king and princes. He says, I gave thee a king in mine anger. You know who that king was? King Saul. They wanted a king. Everybody else had a king. They wanted a king. So God says, well, I gave thee a king. I gave thee a king in mine anger and took him away in my wrath. Now, would God do that? He would, and he did. Now, now turn on to Amos. Right after Joel, you'll come to the little prophet of Amos. Amos chapter 6. Amos chapter 6. Let's begin in verse number 1. I'm interested primarily in verse number 3, but let's start at verse number 1. 
Amos 6, that's right after Hosea, Amos 6 in verse 1, he says, Woe unto them that are at ease in Zion. That word at ease means I'm not worried about anything. I'm just going about what satisfies me in life and makes me happy and not concerned about anything. This just, I'm just trying to make myself happy. He says, Woe unto them that are at ease in Zion and trust in the mountain of Samaria. That's the false gods. As which are named chief in the nations. He says, to whom the house of Israel came. He says, the house of Israel came to these false gods, the false leaders, the false rulers, came to them, put trust in them, and they failed them. And then he says, pass ye unto Calne. And it goes all around through Philistia and all those places. He says, look at those places out there. Look at their ruin. They trusted in them themselves. And look at the ruin that is there. Then he comes to verse number three, and he says, he says, ye that put uh, far away the evil day. Ye that put far away the evil day. That's the idea. Well, nothing bad's going to happen. What are you talking about? <laughs> yeah, I know Isaiah chapter 1 is there, but nothing bad's going to happen. You know, things have been going on for years, and we've been fine for years. Nothing is going to happen. You, 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 you've encountered that idea. No, nothing bad's going to happen. You know, we've been going on fine for all this long time, and... and um, yeah, yeah, that's true. Publicly, our nation has forgotten God. We are trying to erase God out of our public view. But that's all right. Things are just continuing on the way they were from the creation. He says, ye that has put far away the evil. He says, God is not going to do anything. He says, when you do, you cause the seed of violence to come near. He says, your disobedience and your turning away from God is bringing the violence or the trouble near. Then in verse number four, he says, he says, you're those who lie upon the beds of ivory. You've got a bed of ease. You've got everything. You've got everything this world has to offer. And you stretch themselves upon their couches and eat the lambs out of the flock and the cows out of the midst of the stall. He says, you're those who chant to the sound of the vial. That means you go out to the concerts, you enjoy all the blessings, the music, you have the comforts and the blessings of this life, and invent to themselves instruments of music. Oh, by the way, just like David did. Either they drink wine in bowls rather than little cups. Okay? They drink wine in bowls and anoint themselves with, uh, with chief ointments. You know, they have everything. But they are not grieved at the affliction of Joseph. They look, they look around and the common folks who are suffering so badly, there's no sorrow, no grief for them. Verse number 7 says, Therefore, now shall they go captive with the first that go captive. He says, those who think that nothing is going to happen, that put away the evil day, they're going to be the first ones to go. Now, you might say, well, what does that have to do with us? They put away the evil day. Turn with me to the New Testament, to Ephesians chapter 6. To Ephesians chapter 6. What does it have to do with us in the New Testament age? Um, those who, after Christ has come and the Old Testament has been fulfilled. In Ephesians chapter 6, the Apostle Paul tells us this. Verse number 11. Ephesians 6 and verse 11, he says, Put on the whole armor of God, that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this world, and against <coughs> spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the what? In the evil day. What did they say in, the, in uh, Amos' day? They put away the evil day. The Apostle Paul says, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to both withstand and stand in the evil day. So if he's telling us that we need this armor on so that we can withstand and stand in the evil day, what does that tell you about the evil day? The evil day is nigh. And having done all to stand, stand you therefore, having your loins girt about, then he, then he goes into the, the whole armor and what it means and, and how you put it on. Now, there's a philosophy that says that if it happened, 
then God was pleased with all of those things. Would you turn back with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 10. 1 Corinthians chapter 10. I, uh, Paul is writing um, concerning the Old Testament experience, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, and verse number 5. Lord willing, we'll come back to this chapter. Verse, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse number 5. This is the Apostle Paul speaking with his apostolic wisdom and authority. He says, but with many of them, that is in the Old Testament, but with many of them, God was not what? Well, please. That means that God was not pleased with their behavior. For they were overthrown in the wilderness. Now, I want you to keep that in mind. I, I, I want, by the grace of God and mercy, I want to build a picture in your mind this morning. Okay? God was not well pleased, therefore they were overthrown in the wilderness. And so I need to ask the question again. Would God do such a thing? Yes, He would. Now, would you go back with me to Jeremiah? Jeremiah... <clears throat> And I um, want you to notice something that Jeremiah said. This is actually quoted uh, twice. Jeremiah chapter 32 concerning whether or not God is pleased with every behavior all the time. Jeremiah chapter 32 and verse number 30. Let's begin in verse number 31. Jeremiah 30. Um, Thirty-five, Jeremiah 32 and 35. He says, And they built the high places of Baal, which are in the valley of the son of Hinnom. By the way, that valley is just right outside the gate on the eastern side of Jerusalem. That's where this valley is. And they built the high places of Baal. This is the children of Israel, which are in the valley of the sons of Hinnom, to cause their sons and their daughters to pass through the fire unto Molech, which I commanded them not. Neither came it into my mind that they should do this abomination to cause Judah to sin. Now, we read that. Some will say, well, God must have been pleased for them to do that. He was not. He was not pleased with it. It didn't, he didn't command them to do it, and it didn't come into his mind. But that doesn't mean that God didn't know about it. Neither does that mean that God did not have the power to put a stop to it, because he did. Okay? Now, um, I want to show you something else. Let's go back with me to Isaiah chapter, Isaiah chapter 45. You know, I sat there in the seat this morning struggling myself because I wanted to preach some sweet, um, little lovely, gentle message that's uplifting. But sometimes the messages out of the Word of God are not necessarily uplifting. Okay? Isaiah chapter 45. <clears throat> and for the sake of time, we're already running out of time. Um, let's go to verse uh, number 5. Isaiah 45 and verse 4, he said, I am the Lord, and there is none else. Can you say amen to that this morning? I am the Lord, and there is none else. There is no God beside me. By the way, there is no king beside our King Jesus, right? He says, I girded thee, though thou hast not known me. He says, I took care of you, even when you did not even know that I was on scene with you. Then he said, verse number 6, that they may know from the rising of the sun and from the west that there is none beside me. I am the Lord, and there is none. Else. He says, I, God speaking, I formed the light. Amen? He said, let there be light. And there was light. And I create darkness. Darkness is there because I put it there. And I make peace. If we have peace, it's because God made it. All right? And what is the next two words? Create evil. That word evil is not sin. This is bad things. This is in the prophecy of Isaiah. Jeremiah wrote of it in the prophecy of Jeremiah and in his lamentation of the day that God created evil for Jerusalem and uh, 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 Judah because they refused and rebelled against him. Okay? I create evil 
I, the Lord, do all these things. Now, that's hard to say amen to, isn't it? But amen. Our God is truly sovereign. When the people of God do things that God did not command them to do, that did not come into His mind, you know, like Israel, he said to Israel, O Israel, thou hast destroyed thyself, but never forget the rest of that verse. He says, but in me is thine help. We are appealing to that help this morning. For grace to help in our time of need in our nation. Well, they caused their children to pass through the fires to worship Molech. They killed their children. What are we doing in our children? The last statistic that I heard, we were, uh, we were losing over 4,000 babies a month in, uh, a day, pardon me, a day, a day in our country to abortion. We can't even figure out what, what a man and a woman is anymore. One of the hottest debates in our country right now is, uh, why should women have a bathroom that's different from men? We're in a mess, folks. You can't call the name of Jesus Christ. Can't take the Bible into public schools. Can't pray. A football coach can't even bow down on the ball field. But all kinds of, all around the country, people are, they're burning candles. They're having moments of silence. They're feeling sorrow. But you know one thing they're not doing? If they're doing it, they're not saying it. They're not praying. What I, what I, why shouldn't the leaders of the countries get up and say, oh, let's have, let's have the world's greatest prayer meeting for those folks who are suffering now. You know, they used to do that. They used to have uh, church services in the rotunda of the Capitol building of the United States of America. Did you know that? They used to meet together and have a worship service in the rotunda of the Capitol building. All right. So what has happened? All right. Now... <clears throat> Matthew chapter 24. Matthew chapter 24 is a record or is a prophetic record of the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD. <clears throat> Don't have time to prove all that this morning. We'll try to do that in another setting. <clears throat> but the Lord is telling them exactly what would happen to them because he came unto his own and his own what? Received him not. Matthew chapter 24 and verse number 1. Let's begin right there. And Jesus went out and departed from the temple, and his disciples came to him for to show him the buildings of the temple. Uh, that is, they wanted to show him how grand those buildings were. And Jesus said unto them, See ye not all these things? Verily I say unto you, There shall not be left here one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. Now, they... I'm sure that they were amazed. What in the world is he talking about? See this grand building, those big stones there? You're telling me that all of that is coming down? Well, it did. In 70 A.D., that building came down and not one stone was left upon another. Well, what does that have to do with us? Turn with me to Romans chapter 11. Romans chapter 11. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts of the Apostles, and then Romans... Romans chapter 11. Verse number 21. He says, For if God spared not the natural branches, that is Israel, take heed, lest he also spare not thee. Verse number 22. Behold, therefore the goodness... We like to behold the goodness. I sat there on the seat. I want to talk about the goodness of God. But he says, behold, means pay attention, behold therefore the goodness and what? Severity of God, but toward thee goodness, if thou continue in his goodness. You hear that? We want to have goodness, then continue in his goodness. Otherwise, thou also shalt be what? Cut off. I don't want to be cut off, my friends. I appeal to the mercies and the grace of my God. I trust that around this country today, ministers are exhorting those who have assembled to hear the gospel preached, exhorting them to put their attention to Jesus Christ, to structure their lives in obedience to Him. Jesus says, He says, If you love me, do what? Keep my commandments. Don't just mouth it. 
Keep it. That means in obedience. Now, at one time, the idea that God was sovereign even over the nations was the order of the day. That was the predominant thinking. There was a man, his name was Edmund Burke, in the 1700s. He was an Irish philosopher and politician in Great Britain. I want you to notice something he said. He says, the only, you'll recognize this phrase. You may not remember his name, but you'll recognize this phrase. He says, the only thing necessary for the triumph of evil is for good men to do what? Nothing. Nothing. Okay? <clears throat> Ronald Reagan, in 1983, when he was speaking to the National Association of Evangelicals, he said this. He says, freedom prospers when religion is vibrant. That's a lie, means alive and active. Freedom prospers when religion is vibrant and the rule of law under God is acknowledged. You want freedom? That man stated... The method by which we can have freedom. While we are one nation under God, we'll have freedom. We cease to be a nation under God, and the rule of our law is not acknowledged as being under God. We'll lose that freedom. Now, let's go back to Isaiah chapter 1 for just a moment. There's more than I can get to here in 30 minutes. Verse number two, he says, hear, O heavens. That means, the word heaven means aloof. That is, those in authority. Hear, O heavens. That is, those in authority. And give ear, O earth. That means everybody else. Those in authority and those uh, on the ground. Those, everybody else. Hear, O heavens and O earth. For the Lord has spoken. So he's speaking to the rulers and he's speaking to the everyday folks. He says, I have nourished and brought up children. That means I fed you, I protected you, I've loved you, I've instructed you and brought you up. Has he not done so in this country? He's done that. He's nourished and brought up uh, children. And they, those that he nourished and brought up, and they have rebelled against me. Now think about that for a moment. Have we as a nation rebelled against God? Now we can, we can look at court cases. We can look at laws passed. We can, look, we can look at executive orders. We can look at all of those things and see how as a nation that we are progressively rebelling against God. Okay? Then he says, the ox knoweth his owner. He's, he's referring to us as oxen. The ox knows his owner. So when the ox calls, what is, if the ox is in the pasture and the, ox, and the owner calls his name, what does the ox do? He raises his head up. And then when he calls the ox, the ox comes to his master as if to say, I'm ready to serve you. Jesus says, take my yoke upon you and learn of me. That means when I call your name, you come stand under that yoke, I'll put it on you and you'll serve me. You come and serve me, and you be prepared to serve me, to do what I've commanded you to do. You do it with zeal and energy and based upon love. Because if you love me, do what? Keep my commandments. The ox knows his honor, and the ass his master's crib. Do you have a master this morning? Do you? Who's your master this morning? The scripture says, call no man master. You know, we're not calling a man master, but we're calling the Son of God our master. He's our master. He's our Lord. He's our King. He's our priest. He's our Savior. He is our Ebenezer, is he not? All right. So he says, the, uh, the ass knows his master's crib. Did you know your master has a crib this morning? Where's the crib? A crib is where the ass went in to spend the night, where he rested there, where he was fed there. He's speaking of the church allegorically. You know, the ass knows his master's crib. But do we know, as a people, do we know where we're fed, we're clothed, we're protected, we're loved, we're cared for, we're nourished, we're lifted up? Do we know where we get that grace to help in time of need? It is in the master's crib or in the master's house, in the church of Jesus Christ. 
That's what Isaiah 54, Isaiah 62 was all about. As a matter of fact, in Isaiah chapter 62, if you'll go back, you'll find that those who join themselves to the church are as those who are married to the church. Folks don't want to hear that. You know why? Because they don't even know what, they don't even know, they don't, this, the, the modern society does not even want to hear about a biblical marriage. You know why? Because the wife promises that she will submit to the authority of her husband. What do you mean? You know, I've got my own mind. I have my own will. So I'm just going to do what I want to. I'll put on just enough religion to say I've got some religion. Remember what the Lord told the Samaritan woman at the well? He says, The true worshippers must worship the Father, two things, in spirit, and what else? In truth. There is a truth. You know, there cannot be two truths on the same issue. There cannot be two points that's true. Only one is true. God is true. As a matter of fact, one of His names is truth. God is true. His Word is true. You know, I've heard people debate about, is this the Word of God or is it not? You know, I don't have any problem believing that this is the true Word of God in the English language. You start picking it apart, then Brother Jim can decide, decide what he likes is true. Brother Lynn can decide what he likes is true. Brother Joe says, no, I don't like any of that. This has got to be the truth. And you go around the room, you, ruin all you, after all, all you have is a mess. This is the true word of God in the English language. Now, the, the Oxidoth is his owner, and the ass is master's crib, but Israel does not know, my people does not consider. That means we don't stop and think about it. We just thought about living up our lives, just enjoying the blessings and the comforts of life that God has nourished us with and given to us, He's blessed us with. We're enjoying the blessings more than we are, are worshiping the God who gave us the blessings. All right? Notice what he says in verse number 4. All sinful nation. This is an exclamation. All sinful nation. That's an exclamation like, I can't believe that our nation would be so simple. Don't we remember where we came from? Don't we remember how we got what we have? Don't we remember how... We're, uh, we became so well blessed. Don't we remember the founders praying to God and asking God for wisdom in establishing our Constitution? Don't we remember that they wrote that we are endowed with those liberties uh, by our Creator? Don't, don't we remember that? So what do you mean taking the Bible out of the schools and stopping prayer and not calling the name of Jesus Christ? He says, all sinful nation... A people laden with iniquity. A seed of evildoers. He says, you're growing. The iniquity is growing and growing. Children that are corruptors mean they corrupt others with their bad behavior. They have forsaken the who? The Lord. They have forsaken the Lord. They have provoked the Holy One of Israel under what? Anger. Now, does God get mad? Yes, He does. Remember what he did, uh, he told Israel in, um, or, or Jerusalem in Matthew 24, we just read it. He says, there's coming a day that there's not going to be one stone left upon another. He came unto his own, and his own received him not, and he destroyed the city. Would God do that? Yes, he did. As a matter of fact, Isaiah's prophesying also of the time that he would do that when the last king of, of Israel, and, and also last king of Israel, his name was Hosea. That country was destroyed. Judah, the last king of Judah, his name was Zedekiah. And, and, and the, at that time, the city was utterly destroyed and anybody with any education, skill, or training was taken away captivity into Babylon. Who's, uh, Zedekiah, they lined his sons up in front of him and they killed those sons and then they put his eyes out. You know, God turned. Would God do that? Would He turn an invader loose on His people? He did it. 
I had a man tell me one time, I, 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 just, I just don't, don't believe that God could be that cruel. Well, let me tell you something. How cruel is it to turn a bunch of serpents loose into people's tents? He did it. What about wasp? He did that too. Now watch this. Verse number five, he says, Why should you be stricken any more? Ye will revolt more and more. The whole head is sick and the whole heart is faint. He says, You've gotten so involved in ungodliness and immorality, turned away from me, until you're just sick through and through. He says, From the sole of the foot unto the head, there is no soundness, but wounds and bruises and putrefying sores. They have not been closed, neither bound up, neither mollified or with omen. That is an allegory to so say, You ain't been to church. You haven't taken the Bible out and read it. You haven't prayed that God would give you wisdom that you would know how to behave yourself in the house of God. He says, Your country is desolate. He's speaking in prophecy now. Your cities are burned with fire. Your land, strangers, devour it in your presence. And it is desolate as overthrown by strangers. Now you think, all right, we've got, we've got the, most, the most mighty United States Air Force, the most mighty Navy, Army, and Marines. We're still the wealthiest nation in the world. may not be for long, but we are right now. Is it possible that such a mighty nation could fall? King Saul, the first king of Israel, he was a mighty king. As a matter of fact, he stood head and shoulders above everybody else. He was a mighty king, powerful king, a mighty warrior. While he served God... Israel won the battles and grew up and, and obtained great notoriety in the known world. But when he turned away from God, it failed, the nation failed, and he failed. As a matter of fact, he even took his own life. Now, verse number eight, he says, And the daughter of Zion, means my little church, and the daughter of Zion is left as a cottage in a figure, a vineyard, a lodge. In a garden of cucumbers as a besieged city. My little church. I've taken care of my little church. But she's out there all alone. All those blessings that I, I gave to the country for her sake. You know, they're taken away. But she's alone out there. But I'm going to take care of her. You know, Jesus Christ talked about it. He says, upon this rock I build my church and the gates of hell, what? Shall not prevail against it. Sometimes in periods and generations, the little church has been like a cottage. In the vineyard, uh, in the in the, vineyard of in, the, in, the, in the field of cucumbers, just a little building out there away from everybody. And then let's watch this. <clears throat> Except the Lord of hosts. That phrase, the Lord of hosts, signifies the Lord of great power, great majesty. Except the Lord of hosts had left us a very small remnant, like the little church out there in the little cottage, except the Lord of hosts had left us a very small remnant, we should have been as Sodom and should have been made like in Gomorrah. What happened to Sodom and Gomorrah? They were destroyed. He said, if God had not preserved just a small little remnant, we would have all been destroyed. All right? Now, so does that apply to us? Well, let's make sure that we get it down. Why don't you go with me to Romans chapter 9 just for a moment. Romans chapter 9. Verse number 29. Here, the, through the transliteration, Isaiah is spelled Isaiah. Romans 9 and 21. And as Isaiah, or Isaiah said before, except the Lord of Sabaoth. That is a transliteration from the Hebrew to the Greek to the English, which means the Lord of hosts. That's what that means. And as Isaiah said before, except the Lord of Sabaoth, that's not Sabbath, that's Sabaoth, had left us a seed, we had been as Sodom and been made like unto Gomorrah. All right? So if God hadn't been merciful, we'd have all been destroyed. Okay? Now, back to Isaiah chapter 1. 
Verse number 10. He says, hear the words of the Lord. <clears throat> now he's, he's already, he says, y'all need to get this message now. You know, a good old country boy says, y'all need to hear this. <laughs> yeah, you, you, you need to pay attention. Hear the word of the Lord. You rulers of Sodom. He even calls them Sodom. Don't you know what happened to Sodom? He says, you rulers of Sodom. He says, you need to hear this. Give ear unto the law of our God, ye people of Gomorrah. He's talking about the rulers and the people. We all need to hear this word. He says, to what purpose is the multitude of your sacrifices of the means there of the Lord? I am full of burnt offices, of rams and fat, of the fat of uh, fed beasts, and, and I delight not in the blood of bullocks, or of lambs, or of he goats. He says, all that, all that facade of religion that you're going through, it don't mean a thing. You think, you're just checking blocks. You're going out there, you say, I'm going to church, but what do you go to church to do? Do you go to church to worship? No, you go to church to be entertained. You go into uh, the church to see plays and programs. My friends, we go to the church of God to worship. The whole duty of man, uh, 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 Solomon tells us, for the whole duty of man is to fear God and to keep His commandments. To fear God means to hold Him in reverential awe. Are you, are you sitting in awe of God this morning? Is He the mighty God? Is He the God that commanded uh, that let there be light and there was light? Is he the God to you that formed man from the dust of this earth and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and he became a living soul? Is he the God that shut up the garden, uh, the garden of Eden? Is he the God that cast Adam out because Adam sinned? Do you hold your God in reverence and in awe this morning? He says, To what purpose is the multitude of your sacrifices and all these things? He says, There's no benefit in those things. Verse number 12. He says, when you come to appear before me, who hath required this at your hand to tread my course? He says, you come into my house, and who told you to come in here with that attitude? Who come in here? Who told you to come in here uh, thinking that you're better than the king himself? That you're better than God himself? That you can, you can save yourself, you can save your friend, you can save your mama. Who told you that you could come in my course and preaching that stuff? He says, bring no more vain oblations, incense, or an abomination to me. Uh, he said, all your new moons and all your assemblies, he says, I cannot sway with. It is iniquity, even the, the solemn meetings. He says, you come together, you put on a good show, but it don't mean a thing to me. Verse number 15, skip there for the second time. He says, and when ye spread forth your hands, that is in prayer, I will hide mine eyes from you. Boy, this is unsettling, isn't it? He says, Yea, when we, when you make many prayers, I will not hear. Your hands are full of blood. Wash you, make you clean. And how he begins to tell us what to do about it. Now, he says, if, if you love me, do what? Keep my commandments. So here it is. He says, Wash you, make you clean, put away the evil of your doings from before mine eyes. Cease to do evil. This is the remedy. That will put our country back on track, right here. Okay? Remember when Solomon went to the temple, and he had finished the temple, and he went in there and he prayed. And he prayed to the Father, he said, Father, if our people sin and they come to this people and place and pray, will you hear from heaven? Will you forgive their sins? And will you heal their, uh, their lands? Just a few chapters later, the Lord came back to Solomon. Met Solomon in the temple. He says to Solomon, if my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and seek my face and pray, I will hear from heaven and do what? Heal their land. There needs to be some humbling. There needs to be some, uh, uh, some seeking the face of our God and praying, and that is in conforming our lives to the word of God, and he'll heal the land. You know, I am not a fatalist. You know that? I've had old Baptists. People I meet in the street, people I meet in the store, tell me that all hope is lost for our country. I would exhort you to don't accept it. Because right now, in our country, there's people just like you. They're praying. They're looking to the Lord. They're crying out to Him. They're, they're striving to be obedient to the Word of God all across this country. You know, we don't go out and stand on the street corners and say, I'm following Jesus, do you? We don't do that. You know how people know that you're a child of God? You know how they know? By what you say, 
What you don't say, what you do, and what you don't do. That's how they know. You don't need a banner on your back. You don't need a sign on your head. You don't need a bumper sticker. All you need is your behavior and people can see who you are by the way you behave in life. Alright? He says, wash you, make you clean, put away the evil of your doings. Uh, from before mine eyes, cease to do evil. Then he says, learn to do well. Learn to do well? You know, there's a philosophy, that, a vain philosophy that says, when a child is born into this world, all it knows is how to do well. It learns to do wrong. I heard an old preacher one time when I was a little fellow preach, uh, preach on this subject, and this is the analogy that, that he knew, that he used. He said, when a little baby is, is just hadn't been on this earth for very long, it learns real quick to tell a lie. I mean, almost immediately it learns to tell a lie. Because it learns, when it cries, it gets a bottle. Cries and gets a bottle. So, when it needs some attention, what does it do? It cries. Well, it learns. Why cry? It gets some attention. And so, what he's saying is, says, okay. All right, now little mind says, okay. If I make them think I want a bottle, I'll get some attention. Very early, <clears throat> that child learns how to deceive. In Psalm 71, King David said, And in sin did my mother conceive me. That means, as a moment that he was in his mother's womb, he was in a state of sin. And you think, wait a minute, how can I be? He's never done anything wrong. But you know, you have to go back and think, now where did sin come from? Genesis chapter 3, when Adam disobeyed God, that is when sin entered into the world. The three words, and he, forward, and he did eat. That marks the arrival of sin in this world. Paul writes of that in Romans chapter 5. says, by one man, by one man, by one man, sin entered into the world. That was the man Adam. All humanity were, were placed into a state of sin by the action of one man. Then he says, by one man also, all there are many who are saved, delivered, made whole. That one man was Jesus. One man brought sin and one man saved. All right? So, notice what he says. Wash you, make you clean. Um, uh, put away the evil of your doings from before mine eyes. Cease to do evil. Learn to do well. So how do we learn to do well? We learn it. Mama teaches your, your, the children. Don't do this, but do that. Don't say this. Don't let, well, in my case, I even heard, don't look at me like that. You ever heard that? Don't you look at me like that. And there were consequences if I looked at her like that. I mean to tell you, my mom was tough. She was sweetheart. I loved my mom. But she was a tough woman. She said, don't you look at me that way. You know, and you know I, that takes you to get control of yourself, right? Don't you say that. Don't say it like that. You know, we couldn't even say yep to mom and daddy. You could eat it up. You, don't you say that. You know what we said to mom? Yes, ma'am, and no, ma'am. And we did. We need to be careful when we said no, ma'am, too. Where's all that going? We've all set out in the world, and our children are learning to do that which seems right in their own eyes. When Israel did that, Israel failed. What about marriage? What is a marriage, anyway? What is a marriage? Marriage... Is something established by God. God defined message, a marriage. You know that? He said this is what marriage is. He moved Adam in Genesis chapter 2. And let's go back and read that. Hold your hand there. Let's go back and read that. Genesis chapter 2. This is how God defined marriage. Verse number 23. Genesis 2 and 23. And Adam said, under inspiration of God, this is now bone of my bone. That means... Man and woman are not separate. That means they're together as one. They're bone of my bone, and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, because she was taken, what? Out of man. So do we believe that this morning? Do we believe that a woman was made from man? All right. 
You know, it, it, uh, God took, put Adam to sleep, took a rib from his side, and what did he make with it? Woman. All right. Verse number 24. Therefore shall a woman leave, shall a man leave his father and his mother, and shall do what? Cleave his wife. Cleave his wife, and they shall be what? Now, God defined marriage. You leave home, and you have a marriage. A man cleaves his wife. She, he's bound to her as if she is his own flesh. What she enjoys, he enjoys. What she enjoys, he enjoys. They love one another, and they stick together. How long? How long is it supposed to last? Until death do you part. My friends, that's a marriage. And it was a man and his woman, by the way. Now watch this. Learn to do well. You might wait. You know, we reach the point where it's in, imperative that we teach the Word of God to our children and to our grandchildren. When Moses gave the, um, the children of Israel, Deuteronomy chapter 5, and gave them the Ten Commandments the second time, he tells the parents, he says, now when you rise up in the morning, do what? He says, you speak of these things to your children, of these commandments. When you sit in your house with them, you talk to your children about these commandments. When you're in the way with them, you talk to your children about these commandments. He says, and when you lay down at night, you still be talking to your children about these commandments. As a matter of fact, when the children of Israel crossed over the river Jordan into the promised land, they set up stones there. And the reason they set up those stones is that the children might see those stones and say, what mean these stones? Why? What, what's the purpose of those stones? And then... Mom and dad, grandma and grandpa, great grandma and grandpa are supposed to sit down with those children and say, this is why these stones here. The almighty God, the sovereign God brought our forefathers through this wilderness and he fed them and he clothed them. And he said, Did you know that even their clothes didn't get old on the back? Their shoes didn't wear out. They had plenty to eat. They protected them and brought them across this river. And this river was in full flood stage and he made the water stand up and they walked across on dry land. And the little boy says, oh, really? He said, really? He did that. We need to be teaching our children and our grandchildren the truth of the Word of God. All right? He says, learn to do well. Seek judgment. Relieve the oppressed. Judge the fatherless. Plead for the will. That means those who are in trouble, those who are distressed, see about them and help them. Then I'm going to end with this. It's almost like Isaiah was saying, man, that was a tough message. Man, that was, that was not something that you'd, that you'd go a long distance to hear. So Isaiah says, all right, come now. Let us reason together. Let's talk together a little bit. How many of you ever picked blackberries? Blackberries and and the thorns were everywhere, and you had to listen out for rattlesnakes, right? But you get in there, and you, you pull those little branches back with your fingers, trying to get the thorns in your hand, but you get that little blackberry. And I, when I was picking blackberries with my grandmother, I'd put them in the bucket, and I'd watch when my grandmother wasn't looking. What happened to that blackberry? It went in the mouth. Because they were so sweet. And they, I mean, they'd be great big old blackberries, and so sweet and so juicy. Isaiah says, all right. You've had the thorns. Now here's that sweet, juicy little blackberry. He says, come now, let us reason together, saith the Lord, though your sins be as scarlet. Hey, like that. You ever think about yourself and say, why would God pay any attention to me at all? I'm a sinner. Surely God knows all that I've done wrong. He says, come now, let us reason together, saith the Lord, though your sins be as scarlet. Scarlet means bad, 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 bad. Bad, bad, bad. He's as bad as it can get. Though your sins be as scarlet. They shall be as white as snow. Notice he speaks in the future tense. They shall be as white as snow. Then he says, though they be red like crimson. That means bad, bad. They shall be as wool that is white. Do you know the moment? Be careful now. Do you know, know the moment in which you were made? White as snow and white as wool. It wasn't when you said, Lord, would you come into my heart? That don't make any difference. No. If, if anybody has a sense to ask him, he's already in there. All right. There was a moment when the Lord God Almighty 
turned out the lights on this earth. His darling and beloved son had been hanging on the cross for three hours. And then God the Father turned out the light. The earth became dark. In the midst of that darkness, a voice was heard. The voice of the Son of God. At a moment when he who knew no sin was made to be sin for us, his voice was heard. And that voice said, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Because God had stepped back from him so that he could be made to be sin for us. It was necessary that he be made to be sin, that he might bear our sins away from us, to separate us from our sins, that we'd be made white as snow and white as wool. Now, for those who have been made white as wool, he says, if you be willing and obedient, you shall what? Eat the good of the land. I want to eat the good of the land. We've eaten the good of the land for a long time, haven't we? If anybody that doesn't think so, just need to travel just about anywhere else in the world, maybe some of the third world countries, and see how people live. They're people just like we are. But for some reason, they don't have what we have. They haven't been nurtured by the grace of God the way we have. You know, God blessed us by sending His Son to die for us. That was a blessing, amen? For by grace are you saved through faith of that not of yourself. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should what? Boast. But you know, He also feeds us with good things. Comforts of life. We have the comforts of life in this land because God has blessed us with it. Can we lose it? He says, if you be willing and obedient, you shall eat the good of the land. But if you refuse and rebel, you shall be devoured with the sword, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken it. Does God mean what he says? Absolutely. So, the whole duty of man is to fear God and keep his commandments. That's the duty. That's our duty. To take up our cross and follow Him. Again, when He says take up your cross and follow me, what does He mean? What does He mean? A cross represents suffering and anguish and trial and misery. So He says follow me even if it causes you anguish and misery and suffering. Follow me. Do you know when, when John was baptizing down at the river? Those people that he was baptizing, because he was telling them, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Those who he was baptizing, they were imperiling him, them, imperiling themselves because the authorities were, were do, was doing everything they could to stop that. But right in the midst of that, glory appeared. Caught walking down the bank was the Son of God Himself. And John said, behold, the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. And then, the next day, he came again. And he went to John and told John to baptize him. John said, I, I don't want to do that. I know who you are. I don't want to do that. I, I need for you to baptize me. But he said, suffer to be so. And then on that day, something that rarely happens even in the Scripture, the triune God, was clearly manifest that day. John the Baptist took the Son of God, the Word of God, in his hands and went down into the water and baptized him. And when he brought him up out of the water, the Spirit of the God, the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit, appeared and sat upon him and it appeared as a dove. And then God the Father said, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. Can you see that scene? Doesn't that motivate you? Just to leave here and say, Lord, you know, what shall I render unto the Lord for all of His mercies? How can I serve you better, Lord? That's the reason the Apostle Paul explained in Romans chapter 6 what it means to be baptized. That's a mark. That's an establishment that says, I love my Savior God. He gave His life for me. He died. He laid in the tomb and three days later He rose again. I love Him. And I want to be a part of him and his church. It means a change.